Hello, this is a home video. It's intended to be seen by members of my family, both the nuclear family and by my remote family, my siblings, grandchildren, and anybody else. So this is not a professional job. This is a home video, and please do not be concerned with any professional aspects regarding clarity or background or anything of the sort. It's deliberately taken in my living room, in my, in my house. And I'm Nate Azrin, Nathan Azrin, and I'm going to be talking in two, about two general topics. One is talking about personal aspects of my life, and the other will be the professional aspects of my life. And I'll be dividing up different parts of my personal and professional life in different stages. In terms of general background, and this will be rather boring to my siblings if they're watching, and that is that I uh, was born as a part of a family of six children. I'm somewhere in the middle. We were all born around the time of the Great Depression, which is a rather exquisite timing on the time of my parents. And that is we were born in the period of about 1925, I think, until about 1933 or so. My parents owned a grocery store. It was a, what's called a mom and pop operation. And they also owned the house in which that store was uh, was embedded, and the store was at the bottom level, of course, the lower level, and they rented out a couple, one or two of the apartments, and we occupied one of the apartments above there. And I lived there for until I was about 10 years of age. This is in a section of Boston that is known as the South End, not to be confused with the South, with South Boston, but the South End. My parents were both from uh, Europe, and that is from Russia, and they spoke English at, at home and some Yiddish. They made a superb effort to go into speak English as much as they possibly could because they wanted to be American and didn't want their language to be to go into be a barrier. So they spoke English as much as they could, and of course that's very different from what we see in South Florida right now, where people who come from South America or Cuba, they pride themselves and insist on speaking Spanish, even if to people who don't understand the language. Uh, one notable aspect of the family was, of course, that my father was blind. He suffered from some type of a genetic eye, eye problem um, called retinitis pigmentosa, which is concerned with uh, dysfunction of the of the retina. He uh, refused to acknowledge the fact that he was blind, and uh, heaven forbid that anybody should ever use that word in talking to him. He did not use a cane. He did not use a seeing eye dog. He did not use braille, and he would not ever introduce tell anybody that he was speaking to to go into excuse his mannerisms or his lack of attention to them because he was blind. As far as he was concerned, he could function completely. And in point of fact, he was the one who conducted the grocery store. And if anybody came in and asked for a particular item, he would know exactly which shelf it was on and where it was on the shelf, and <laughs> would proceed to obtain the item and give it to them and go and take the money from them and make the change. And so he, he, functioned, he functioned beautifully. Uh, my mother uh, was from Russia, from Kiev. And uh, neither she nor my father had anything in the way of formal education, either certainly not college and certainly not high school. Uh, my father, though, was very well versed with regard to the Bible. And it was always a source of amazement to me that when he was in the temple, he would be able to chant along on the, with the chants that were being given at the moment without, of course, looking at any Torah or the Bible, because, of course, he couldn't see, he couldn't read. I, some of the most pleasurable parts of my early youth there, this is before I was 11, was spending time with my father and uh, going places with him, not escorting him, but accompanying him. In other words, you didn't lead him. You, he would be close by you, and he would have enough vision or enough hearing so he'd know where, you, where I was. And we would discuss everything. We would discuss what was going on in the world at large, and the news, and, that, and things that we saw. The General Times, this is now in the 1930s, 
was very, very different from what we have here now. We didn't have washing machines, we didn't have dishwashers, we didn't, and so we had scrub boards instead of a washing machine. Dishes you just did by, did by hand. There were no refrigerators, there were ice boxes. And so ice, the ice man would come along every day and he would deliver a block of ice if you ordered it to your house and you put it in your ice box, not your refrigerator. In order to keep cool, you went to the beach or we would sit out on the steps in the outside of our house and we have some pieces of ice and we would suck on them. Uh, one of the favorite activities during the summer was we would go to the beach, Carson Beach, and that was about three miles, I think, four miles away from our house. And the whole family, except my father and my grandmother, would accompany us. So there would be all s six children, plus my mother, seven of us, and we would go as a, as a little, as, as a little uh, battalion or as a little company, and we would go and troop off to go to the beach and would have a wonderful time as we were going together to the beach and of course we would spend a wonderful time at the beach. The, my father never went to the beach. Uh, he always stayed at home with my grandmother. The other person in our family was not only us six children and the two parents, but it was an extended family. That is, it was my, my grandmother was living with us. It's not the way it is, is now. And my parents' attitude toward us is very different from what I see parents' attitudes are now toward their own children and the way, and that is that parents are continuously driving their children to one activity or another, to a party, to a celebration, to dance lessons, to music lessons. That never happened. Uh, our parents never took us to any of those places. We went to our primary school, it was just a few blocks away, and we all walked to that. And when we went to the grammar school, that was also just a few blocks away, there was a place called a settlement house across the street from us, and that had recreation and social events. My parents went to them, and I did. Everything was walking distance. We almost never took a bus or what they call the elevated trains, the, the equivalent of subways. We, we, walked, we walked everywhere. And that was true, and part of the reason for that was, is of course, economic. That it cost money, it cost five cents to go on the, Those early days, this is now up to the time I was 10 years of age, in the south, living in the South End, uh, I look back on that and I'm amazed. We didn't do any chores. I didn't do any chores. My brothers didn't do any chores. What we did do, though, as part of the family functioning, was we would take care of the store. And that is that there was a doorbell, a bell on the door, the front entrance to the store, and when the people came in the store, the bell would ring, and whoever was and within hearing distance would yell, Customer! Customer! <laughs> and whoever happened to be nearby, whether they were in the kitchen or the living room or the bedroom, they would come, you would come running out to go in to attend to the customer. And we all did that. Uh, my brothers and sisters did that. My father did that. My grandmother in particular, she was apparently owned the store beforehand. And she worked with, and uh, my father sort of inherited it. So that was the general atmosphere in terms of who, how we associated with each other. Uh, my younger brother, who was just a year and a half younger than me, Morris, he and I, I am told, and I remember, we were just engaged in perpetual horseplay. We were just play fighting all of the time. And so we just had a wonderful time with each other. And uh, our parents, they never relied on punishment, and certainly no physical punishment, not even the threat of it, not even the removal of any privileges. There was just none of that. Everything was just fine. The one thing I remember my mother in particular saying over and over again when we were playing in the house or doing things in the house was, get out of the house, <laughs> get out of the house. In other words, she was so busy, right, preparing meals, doing the laundry, taking care of everything, sewing, she did, she did all the sewing, and, and, she was the, and she was so busy, get out of the house. And that's just such a contrast now with the way I see parents taking care of their children, and that is we know, want to know where they are at all times, and preferably to accompany them and to make sure that they are in the presence of some type of supervisory adult. So 
that was the that was some of the family part of it. The general ambience in the world at large now was very different than what it is now. Uh, we had this store. My parents had this store, as I say, there's a mom and pop type of store, and we all worked in that store. And right in the next block was a cathedral church, they called it, and it was the principal Catholic church in Boston. And so, so that was a site of a good deal of activity. The general pop the general neighborhood that we grew up in, I guess is best described as one of immigrants. And most almost all of them were Catholic, well, almost all of them were Catholic, and that is Irish and Italian. I never heard the word Protestant in my life while I was here. <laughs> I thought everybody in the world was Irish or Italian. There were fewer people from the middle European country, and that is from Hungary and Romania and, and all. But, and they were all immigrants. Either they themselves or their parents had come over, and their task was to go into have themselves assimilated into the American culture. And they were all very much local, what people would call the, the working class. They were, virtually none of them were professional. I didn't know a single professional person in the neighborhood where we lived. The, uh, the, the, the school that we went to, I remember, was Joshua Bates School. We all, we, all of our brothers and sisters went, went to that, and so it was very nice when you, started, you were promoted. One of your brothers or sisters knew exactly who the teacher was and what that teacher's mannerism was. And so uh, it was it, no busing, no segregation, not, nothing of that sort. Uh, I don't remember any Asiatics in that neighborhood. I don't remember any Hispanics in that neighborhood. I don't remember any blacks in that neighborhood. These were all white European immigrant children. And, and it was a very much a law-abiding neighborhood. The parents there were very strict. That is, that they had high standards of conduct. They're not that they used punishment. Very high standards of conduct, and they expected their children to conduct themselves is most more important than anything else to respect to respect their elders. The anti-Semitism was a rule. Uh, people didn't use the word Jew. They used the word. It was always a combination: dirty Jew, a Jew bastard. Never used the word Jew by itself. It was always just uh, some kind of libelous word attached to it. And we were the only Jews in the neighborhood. As far as I was concerned, there were no Jews in the world except our family. The one time that I was told that there were other Jews around was when it was a high holiday and we went to the temple and then there would be a large number of people and men who came in and they had suits and ties and the women were all dressed up. I thought they were from another planet. <laughs> that, because uh, I, were, I had never, during our everyday living, never seen another Jew, and certainly my parents never dressed that way. There was a good deal of anti-Semitism at the time. This is, this is in the 30s now, and in the international scene, Hitler was promulgating his anti-Semitism, and the scene I remember most vividly is the, our family huddled around the radio, there's no television, of course, at the time, and listening to Hitler, of course, the, the rant and rave and insisting that all Jews in this world must be exterminated. That meant us. And, and then hearing this groundswell of applause, a hundred thousand people applauding when he, when he said this. And I guess all of us just cringed. They just cringed. So this anti-Semitism was the rule, and it wasn't just Hitler talking. There was a fellow, a fellow in the Catholic Church named Father Coughlin, and he supported everything that Hitler said. And he went and he advocated that the Americans should adopt the same policy as Hitler and exterminate all Jews, not only from Europe, but from the United States. So that was the general atmosphere, and we were the only Jews in the neighborhood. There were no other Jews, as far as I was concerned. There were no other Jews. We were all alone, our family all, all by itself. In terms of school, uh, I was the person in the family that did well in school, not because I was particularly bright, I know that, it's because I tried harder. And that is, I enjoyed school, I enjoyed the schoolwork, I enjoyed doing it. 
And my mother thought that, well, I was, of all of the children, I think she felt that I embodied her ideals of what she hoped her children would be in America. And that is that I would be the scholar. I would be the one that was the educated one. And so, never interrupted. I see, I spent more time going to the library and obtaining books and more time reading and reading, reading books and had got uh, enthusiastic encouragement from my mother on, on, on that part. About my father, well, he was busy taking care of the store and, and taking business like most fathers were at that time. And the general atmosphere in that neighborhood, again, was large families. There were six of us in our family, and the norm at that time for families was that you had about six, six children, not the way it is now where you have one child or you're overworked if you have two children. So I did very, very well in school. Well, then the second phase now was when we moved from that neighborhood. And what the reason for the move was not something that was self-initiated on the part of my parents, but rather there was a slum clearance project. <laughs> the government tore down the entire block, the entire neighborhood. They went and built these, built these subsidized housing. And they reassured us that, well, when they finished building it, that we would be first in line and we could move into it. But in any case, they demolished it entirely. My parents, and they paid my parents for the house that they owned. And we moved to an area of Boston called Roxbury, Roxbury and then Dorchester. And the cultural change was just staggering. And that is, instead of being the only Jews in the neighborhood, it was virtually all Jews. <laughs> it was, there was synagogues there, everybody there was, went, went, went to the temple, and they were, they were all Jews. And they, when I, so that, that, that was, and anti-Semitism was just unheard of. And by that time, the war had broken out. I was 11 years old when Pearl Harbor occurred. And so all of a sudden, the uh, Italians were now part of the Axis. They were the enemy. And the Germans, that they were the enemy. <laughs> so uh, everything was changed now. And that is, there was no more, no more of the anti semitism And then, of course, when Israel got founded in 1948, the self-esteem and the status of the Jews in general throughout this country was just elevated enormously. We now had our own country. Well, so, and, and I, when I went to this new neighborhood, Roxbury, that was in the 11th, I was about 10 or 11 years old at the time, and I was in grammar school, and I continued to do very, very well in school, and I had some very close friends that lived in the neighborhood. Again, it was like Boston, when I lived in the South End, that you didn't have to go far for friends. They were next door, they were upstairs, your whole block was filled with people, was filled with children your age, and so there was no shortage of games to play and to go and do things with them. What happened when I was in, when I was in Roxbury was I went to a school in which uh, I did very well, as I always did in school, and, and so I was nominated and was uh, for attending Boston Latin School, and that was a, one of the top academic schools in Boston. Boston Latin School, it turns out, is there was the first public school in the United States. I think right after the pilgrims landed here at Plymouth Rock, they immediately started a school. It was in the 1600s. And uh, they, I think they still used the same textbooks. They taught Latin and Greek and German and science and mathematics and chemistry and English. And, but no modern subjects. Heaven forbid that they would give typing. Never that. No driver's education. They never did that the way other schools did. So it was a college prep school, and so I went to that. I went to Latin school, and that meant I had to now take the subway, the public transportation system, every day. It cost five cents each, each way. Uh, and oh, if I can, uh, if I can, revert back to what happened in Boston. I didn't mention it. One of the things that I did besides staying in the store and taking care of things was I was a newsboy. And that Catholic church that I mentioned that was so nearby on Sundays, I would have an arm full of papers and I would stand outside the door. When people came out, there was something like six, five, four or five masses per day, one at eight, one at nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And I would be out there with these Sunday papers and would be selling them and occasionally 
some of the churchgoers would say, why aren't you in church? Why aren't you selling it? But in addition to that, I also was a newsboy in other ways, and that is that during the week, and especially on weekends, I would go around and sell papers in some of the restaurants and especially in some of the bars. They call them saloons. And I would go into the saloon and I would go and sell the newspaper. And at that time, newspapers were very inexpensive. In any case, I would go there and I remember my mother, she would worry about me going into these bars by myself and so she often would wait outside to make sure that I came out. And when we finished, when I finished doing my tour and went through all of the bars, then we would go and stop off at a bakery and she'd buy me a strudel <laughs> I could bring that home and we'd eat the strudel and the coffee and to this day I just love strudels and still have that wonderful feeling of coffee when I drink coffee and then during the week in the morning I delivered I would go and deliver things to the to the neighbors and it usually was milk bread and cigarettes that was the usual combination milk bread and cigarettes and I had a list of the people, and it was, I, I went visit, I visited about 10, 12 different houses, and we delivered the, deliver the groceries to those places. And of course, they would pay up at, at the end of the week. Well, getting back now to Roxbury, where I was living. Uh, I, so I went to the Boston Latin School, and that was in the seventh grade, and that went to the 12th grade. And that was not a neighborhood school. Unlike my other brothers and sisters, they all went to a neighborhood schools. And so they had friends that they went to school with. But Boston Latin School, everybody commuted. They all came from remote parts of Boston. And that was very much a formal school. Uh, you didn't go to school in jeans or in shorts or anything like that. You wore a tie and a dress shirt and a jacket. And you addressed your teachers as sir. There were no women teachers, of course, at that time that women were forbidden to be teachers if they got married, and then they liberalized that. So they were all called Miss something, Miss O'Brien, Miss Fisher, or whatever. And if they were pregnant, even if they, when they were married, and they were allowed to teach when the laws became more liberal, then as soon as they were pregnant, then they had to quit, right? So, <laughs> so it was an entirely, so they were all male teachers at the time. And in fact, it was called BLS, Boys Latin School. Since then, they've renamed it. Now it's become co-ed. And they had a boy BLS and a GLS. GLS, Girls Latin School, a separate school for girls. And now the principal of Boys Latin School, which is not Boys Latin School, now it's called Boston Latin School. Uh, so very, very formal. And the subjects, as I said earlier, that were very, very traditional. That is, you Latin and Greek and German and French and ancient history and mathematics and chemistry and physics, all of the sciences, but none of the modern types of topics. And the most conspicuous part of it, beside the extreme, the extreme discipline in that school, was uh, that they, uh, the, the number of people who flunked out. When we entered the first day, the principal went and said, I want you to look to your left and look to your right, and of the three of you, there were two of you who will not be here in graduation. <laughs> You're going to flunk out. And so they flunked out, actually, two-thirds of the individuals that were there. And one of the most uh, uh, disturbing parts of the school was the incredible amount of homework. There was four hours of homework, at least, every night, and more, of course, on weekends. Everybody went home with a book bag, they called it, a pouch, a bag full of books. So they had about 10, 12 books in there that you took home with you. And I still remember some of the students had a very large number and they almost had a hunchback from carrying all those books. What that meant is that your adolescence now was spent in studying, not socializing, not belonging to clubs, not interacting with other people but studying four or five hours every single night, including, including weekends. And so the memory of other graduates of that school that I've talked to is that they wish they never have gone there. It's the worst thing in the world that could have happened to them, that their social life was completely absent, they could do nothing. Well, not only did I have those four hours of work there, but I also had to work. This is now during the war, especially, and that is from 41 to 45, 
and an enormous shortage of labor, and so the businesses were very eager to employ students, teenagers. And labor laws notwithstanding, uh, I started working when I was, what, 12 years of age, and I remember I worked in a drugstore for a good time, and that, they had, uh, what was it, five-hour shifts, and I sometimes worked two five-hour shifts on weekends, but five-hour shifts on weekdays in addition to all that homework. And then after that, I worked in a chemical company, and this was a very small chemical company. It was just the owner, myself, and one other employee. It was just three of us. And that was uh, pouring the chemicals, bottling them, canning them, shipping them, carrying them around. And we had these big, big uh, glass jars of chemicals, and we would pour the chemicals out of that. And unfortunately, I got exposed to so many chemicals that now are considered to be dangerous and uh, I'm sure that that had an effect on my future health. And the DDT at the time, I remember I worked there without my shirt on, and it got all over my body, <laughs> and I suffered all kinds of strange sensations. Well, so I worked very hard while I was a teenager in this chemical company and in this drugstore before that, and then also this, that's, had that's all that uh, homework from the, from the school. Well, meanwhile, my parents still reacted to me in the same way. They were completely supportive. They were delighted. I was the one person in the family who, look, I, was, I might be going to college. And they were delighted that I was taking school work so seriously uh, because my other brothers and sisters, unfortunately, did, did not have that opportunity and incentive for, for that. And so every day I, I uh, went through what they call a subway education. That is, every day I took the subway and the buses and the transit and the elevated and spent uh, about three quarters of an hour each, each day going back, back and forth. But I would open up my books while I was on the bus or the train and I would be reading while, while I was there. Well, when I graduated from high school, I thought I would be going to Harvard because, incredibly, looking at the yearbook of that school in retrospect now, where people indicate in their yearbook what college it is that they would be going to, and a shot, an astonishing 30% of the class listed Harvard. Imagine 30%. Of this high school class was going to Harvard here in Fort Lauderdale. If there's one student going to Harvard in a school, then the newspapers practically put that in the headlines, and the school celebrates for years afterward. But here, 30 percent were going. Well, I didn't. I, I didn't make it in that. And part of the reason was that in my senior year, my mother became very ill. She had a very large tumor in her abdomen and was hospitalized for a good while. And there was nobody to take care of the store because we had another store there in, in Roxbury. And so I stayed out of school for about six, eight weeks. And uh, I sent the homework in and all, but anyhow, I missed that. And so my grade, I had A's, straight A averages before that, but in my senior year, all of a sudden, it dropped down because I, I missed all the classes. So I didn't get into Harvard as an undergraduate, but I did get in to Harvard in graduate school, so I ended up obtaining my Ph.D. from Harvard, even though I didn't go there as, as an undergraduate. Well, while I was at, this is now getting more now into the professional part of things, and that is, what, what is it that I did in my chosen field, which is psychology? When I entered a college, that was at Boston University, I started off intending to be a science major and uh, specifically was going to major in chemistry. I had a cousin, Meyer Ezrin, who was a chemist, and I, I guess in a way I was almost emulating him. And I started majoring in science and took all the chemistry, physics, and biology courses. But then I took a required course. I was required by, they had area requirements. You had to have so many hours in the literature and science and the humanities and social studies. And there was one there that was in the social studies. It was a psychology course, and so I had to take that and took it only because at that time I was free and I, and I needed the credits in that. And that was inspirational. That was just, that's where I wanted to be, that finding out what the causes of human behavior are and finding out treatments and finding out what works, what will help people. That, that's, that was a worthy thing to go into set as the goal of my life. And, uh, and, and never mind just being stuck in a chemistry lab pouring things into a test into a test tube. 
So uh, that really turned me on, and from then on I, I just took all of the psychology courses that were there. I only spent three years in college because I accelerated. I went summers, and so I did four years in three, in three years. And I had my bachelor's degree then, it was 1951, so the war was over for a while. There were, the universities were filled with returning GIs, that is, from soldiers that had gone back. And I applied to college, and at that time, Brandeis University was founded. He was founded right after the Second World War, because prior to that, you couldn't, Jews couldn't get into, into colleges because of the anti-Semitism. And so there was a frantic push to start, for the Jews to start their own college, and that was right in the Boston area, Brandeis University. And I, it was their first year. They were just opening up, <laughs> and I, I applied to it. And I was interviewed by the president, his name was Sacker, and I was asking him about what courses that they would be giving and about what they could do in terms of majoring in chemistry. And he made a classic comment that sticks with me, and that is, stop asking me those specific questions about courses. I don't know if the door will be open in September. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, so that discouraged me from going there, and they offered me a wonderful scholarship, an extra stipend, which was fantastic. I needed the money. Uh, so I didn't go there. Instead, I went to Boston University. And there was a cute little anecdote that I want to relay about that, and that is that uh, my parents were really very poor, and so the, uh, having enough money to go and pay for tuition see, was a staggering expense, even though at that time it seemed like the bargain of the century, namely tuition for the year was only $400 per year. Now it's almost that per credit hour. So uh, I worked all summer. I worked double shifts. I, and I, I, I heard that there were scholarships available, and so I figured I'd, I'd apply for one, but being as naive as I was, where do you find out about scholarships? Look in the yellow pages of the telephone book, right? That's where all the information is. So I looked on the S on the scholarships, and sure enough, there was a, an advertisement there, at Edwards Scholarship Fund, that opened for Boston residents, especially newsboys. Great, I was a newsboy. And so I applied for it, and lo and behold, they sent me a letter saying, you have it. Meanwhile, uh, I applied, well, I, I went to matriculate at Boston University in the liberal arts school, and I showed up to, to go into the registrar's office, would pay the tuition, and I had saved all this money from working double time all week for the entire summer, and, and pulled out the money that I had. I was supplemented. I, we all, I had the money, and my mother supplemented a small part of it. And they uh, said, oh, no, it's all paid for. And I said, no, 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 I, I have the money here. I didn't think I would have the money, but I do have it here. I saved up. I worked all summer, so I have the money. And, and they said, no, no, the Edwards Foundation, it's all paid for. I said, well, well here, call them up and tell them to give it to somebody who needs it, because I don't need it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that I needed it more than anyone else. And, uh, and so they insisted and said that if they don't take it and send it back, they'll never give a scholarship again to anybody in the university. They would, they would lose credibility. And so they insisted that I take it. It was just for the semester in any case. So I, I thought that was, and that was part of the tradition that we had in our family. Never take charity. No charity. Even though my father was blind, and he would qualify for any kind of charity that he, that he w would want, that a whisper, never. And, and that they looked down on people who would take, would take, my parents looked down on individuals who would take charity. So I enrolled in college and I changed my major from chemistry, well, I had a dual major from chemistry to psychology. And, and I remember preparing myself, deciding, well, what kind of a, what can you do as a psychologist? And so I went to the chairman of the department and said, I'm thinking of majoring in psychology. What can I expect in terms of making a living? What kind of salary is it? And he went and said, oh, yeah, full professor. You get a full professor in college, in, in psychology, and you can go and you make $3,500 a year. Well, that just seemed extravagant. <laughs> And so, I, no, no, no other questions, good, then I'm going to major in psychology. And so I majored in psychology, and I did, ve did very well. I, I, I got all A's, I don't think I ever got a, a B in psychology. And I went on, they had a master's program, and I did that in one year, and obtained my master's degree and enrolled in their doctoral program in a department called Personality and Social Psychology. 
not clinical, personality and social. So the big names there were Gardner, Murphy, and Allport, and Sears, and people who were not in clinical, not in experimental, that they were in this new area of social and personality. And, and I specialized in the area of child psychology and uh, in group dynamics. There was one psychologist in particular, Kurt Lewin, who was an immigrant from Nazi Germany, and uh, he was using the experimental method in group dynamics. He was studying and using actual experiments and getting data and numbers. <laughs> well, I was practically through with that program. I, they had a general examination where they examine you in anything in psychology and a statistics exam and all that. And I passed all of those and I was all ready to start my dissertation and I, I would have been out in one semester. And I stopped and said, wait a minute. <laughs> Here, I rushed through school in three years, I got a master's in one year, I went through the doctoral program and in, in, another, in one more year, and is this where I really want to go, this field that I'm going to? It, it's a farce. That, am I going to go and teach parents how to, how to raise their children? I, don't, I haven't read anything that shows any data on that, on what the different procedures are for dealing with problems or for maximizing learning, I thought they were all correlations and people citing authorities in clinical psychology, they, citing Freud and Adler and Jung, and I, I had re I read everything I could get my hands on in Freud when I was an undergraduate, and that area fascinated me. That's why I majored in it, but then when I was at this stage now, of where, what I was, the jumping off point of what I was going to be doing for a living, what am I going to do? I'm going to be teaching and then getting people to cite other author know-it-alls, the authorities, and, and, and people just citing things and correlations. And this is not what I wanted to be when I grew up. And, and at that time, I, became, I accidentally happened to read a book by Keller and Schoenfeld. They were the authors called Principles of Psychology or Principles of Behavior. And it talked about operant conditioning and these studies, that would, and it was all animal studies, but it was all numbers, it was all data. You talked about number of responses, rate of response, the resistance to extinction, <laughs> the high rates, and uh, that's fantastic. Uh, and, and so I, 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 that's where I want to go. And uh, the person who was the real innovator and the developer of that, of course, was B.F. Skinner. I said, well, I'm going to go study with him. And where was he? He was at Harvard, so I applied to Harvard. And so I applied to Harvard, not to be a Harvard student, <laughs> but to go into work with Skinner. And what I wanted to do was to learn from Skinner. And one of the factors that, uh, that encouraged me to go there is that when I read their catalog, they said that only two years were required in their graduate program to obtain a PhD. Well, wonderful. Then even though I had left this other program, I'd be spending maybe a, one semester there, maybe even a year. And if I went to, Har I went to Skinner, I'd learn that. I, I could be out in two years, and here's a day, here's a subject matter that's got data, that's got numbers in it. And it was anti-theoretical, not only non-theoretical, but anti-theoretical. So I went to Harvard, so I applied to Harvard, and the circumstances behind my applying to Harvard are uh, worthy of comment, and that is that while I was at Boston University, I was working part-time at a laboratory that was doing a study on the effects of radiation on dogs. Remember the atomic bomb had just occurred a few years ago and no one knew much about it. And so I was working on this project and of all things using a delayed response, uh, maze learning. And one of the other people working on it was a fellow who was a student of Skinner's named Ogden Lindsley. And we became very close friends. We were working shoulder to shoulder and spent a good deal of our time talking about psychology and what we were going to do when we grew up, <laughs> what kind of things we hoped to do with when we, we obtained our PhDs. And so he suggested that he suggested and encouraged me to apply to Harvard to get to work with Skinner. And so I went down to see Skinner, talked to him, and it turned out by a wonderful coincidence, Skinner, having spent all of his life doing animal work, wrote a book called Science and Human Behavior. What he was interested in was extrapolating some of the principles of reinforcement and operant conditioning to human behavior, to education, to art, to humor, to 
all of the gambling to uh, all of different facets of human conduct and all all at the theoretical level and so I uh, and here I came along saying my object is to go into take principles of operant conditioning and apply them to human problems and so that was a natural marriage it was wonderful and so he was delighted that I was coming and welcomed me with open arms and so I applied to have it and uh, with uh, Oglinsley's encouragement and was accepted meanwhile uh, another aspect was as a senior at Boston University, after having read this wonderful book by Kellen Schoenfeld and learned about opera conditioning, decided, well, let, let me try some of these things out. Let me try doing the study on humans, not on animals, the way Skinner was, on humans. And what subject would be it's something that's complex, cooperation, not something just pressing a lever, but cooperation. And so. I designed a study where I would have children, uh, pre-teenagers, uh, working on a game that required cooperation and designed it so that whenever they did coordinate their activities rather than working independently, then that was a cooperative response. And I used reinforcement. I used jelly beans as a reinforcer. And every time that they made a cooperative response, then I dropped the jelly bean into the chute where it went down to where they were, because I was in the other side of the wall, and did an, what's called an ABA design, first baseline of no reinforcement to see how much cooperation there was, then reinforcement of the cooperation, and then back to baseline. And, uh, and it was interesting how I decided what statistic to use on that. So, uh, so the, the strategy that I used in the statistics there is probably somewhat humorous, right? Because uh, statistics were coming on, were being developed at that time very strongly. The Fisher and T-tests and correlation coefficients, uh, analysis of variance hadn't yet started. But the question, which statistics should I use? And I decided to use the simplest <laughs> of all statistics, and that is the binomial theorem. And I said, well, here, I want, I, I expect, the, I'm going to shoot for uh, ascertaining whether the results will be significant at the 0.001 level, that is one chance in a thousand. And so, how do you calculate that? Well, if you start off with a yes or no, and that is, did, it, did the behavior increase or decrease? And if you predicted it increased, then the probability of that happening, yes or no, is one half. Of it happening with two subjects is one, one fourth, multiply it by two, is one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, <laughs> and so forth. And so it took ten subjects to come to 1,024. One chance in 1,024. That's the 001 level. So that's how I decided how many subjects to use, and that is ten subjects. And then if all of them showed the change in the same direction, then it was significant at the O1 level. And so I did that. Well, so I did that study, and uh, I ended up publishing it. It turned out to be, I think, probably the first study that was done in operant conditioning, albeit in a laboratory situation that is a contrived situation on humans. But that, that was the very beginning. And once I got into Harvard, my strategy was, well, I'm one out of here in two years. And so it was rather humorous how I plotted my general study strategy, and that is, I want to be labeled as an A student. So the first semester, I'm not going to do anything else, no laboratory, no experiments, nothing. I'm going to be concentrate on my studies and be labeled as an A student. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. I, got, I did get one B, but the rest of them were A's. And then I started immediately on working on my dissertation that was in my second semester, which is rather unheard of. And the topic that I decided on was uh, something of an anomaly, and I look back on it, a rather brave thing to do. Here I was working in Skinner's lab, and he's known for positive reinforcement, especially po the operant conditioning, positive reinforcement, and anti-punishment, and had written several articles decrying the use of aversive stimuli <laughs> and punishment. And what did I choose for the, my general topic of interest? Yeah, what it was is I chose the area of aversive control, that you, at that time, theories of learning and positive reinforcement were rife. 
There was a book by Hilgard called Theories of Learning, and it listed about uh, six or seven different theories of learning, and they're all talking about positive reinforcement. And I think the big vacuum in the field is, what about aversive stimuli? What about punishment? That, On the factual basis, we know so little on it. We certainly had strong feelings about it that you couldn't pick up any writings in psychology that didn't say don't use punishment, that punishment it not only shouldn't be used, but it, it's ineffective. It doesn't have a big effect, secondly. It doesn't last. It doesn't teach you what to do. <laughs> it only teaches you what, what, not, what not to do. And so all of the common generalizations about punishment were don't use it. And, but when you looked at the data and the studies, the, the, they didn't show that at all. And so what I did is decided I would go and study punishment with the same seriousness and the same detail that positive reinforcement was. And just the way Skinner was doing it, with schedules of reinforcement, positive reinforcement, I was using schedules of punishment. So I did that, and, uh, w and uh, the general climate at Harvard at that time was very different from the doctoral situation in other universities since then that I've been at. And that is another university. You have a proposal, and you go and you do a long review of the literature and cite everything in sight that is in any way relevant to your to your topic, and you spell out what the details would be and what your hypothesis is and what statistics you would use and why it's important and how you'll interpret your results, and you plot it all out in advance, and only after you've obtained approval by a arbitrarily appointed committee then you can start it. You are not to collect any data until after it's been approved. Well, I remember at Harvard, they didn't work it that way at the time. It was more of the Germanic tradition. And uh, I remember I, I started working on punishment, and then I walked over, I walked up to the chairman, who was going to be the chair of my committee, and asked him uh, what he thought of what I had found so far. Did it look like that might be sufficient for some, the substance of a dissertation, and his response was, I, I won't read it. The, I, I will read what you have at the time that you have completed your studies and you have it all written up, ready to be put in bound form. <laughs> and they would talk about it. And, I even, and then I went and showed it to Skinner. And, uh, I expected there to be a pretty strong negative reaction because here he was t talking about all the positive reinforcement and staying away from punishment, how terrible it was. And he was wildly enthusiastic. That's wonderful. It's about time somebody took the subject matter of punishment seriously and studied what it really does and not what for, for uh, extraneous reasons, religious reasons or political reasons that they condemn it. And so that was wonderful. He was a true empiricist. It was just fantastic. I'd come to the right, I'd come to the right place. Uh, but in terms of advice as to what to do, or analyze it, or what to do next, uh-uh, do, do whatever you want. It was, you were on your own. This was a sink or swim department. And so I went ahead and uh, continued the studies on that and submitted that in my re as for my dissertation. And I thought that that would, thing would go fine. I, my wife, I, I was married, and my marvelous wife, she was, <laughs> she was actually typing as I was running the study. <laughs> and she was doing that at night. And, and, and uh, I got the thing done in time, and, and it kept getting turned down. My committee kept turning it down. I couldn't understand it. Why did they kept turning it down? And, uh, and I, I had some thoughts about that after, but as though somebody suggested to me that the, one of the background factors may have been that nobody had ever gotten their degree in two years from Harvard. There was only one person there who had, and that, was, and that person happened to be on my committee. And, <laughs> and then no matter what it is that I would submit, they would not approve it. Well. It turned out after graduation day passed, the deadline passed for sending it in. Suddenly they approved it, and that, that was fantastic. So that may have been the hidden agenda, I don't know, but they did approve it. And I went and graduated, and, and now what is it I'm going to do for the rest of my life? 
Well, in the meantime, while I was going to college, I had the good fortune to go and to meet Vicky Victoria Bessalel was her maiden name. She was an undergraduate at the time, and I was a first-year graduate student. And, you know, we used to drink coffee together with other students in the university cafeteria, and occasionally we went over to the beer parlor across the way. And she was a, an exciting, enthusiastic person who was just eager to live life to its, <laughs> to, to its, to its utmost. And, uh, and we hit it off, and we, uh, we, during the break in the, in the academic year, was during the Christmas vacation, uh, we got married, and she got permission. She, she was hoping to do a, take a makeup exam because she missed her final. And that, that was bad news. The professor refused to allow her makeup. She appealed it to the dean. And the dean said, yeah, you tell him he has to give the makeup. He has no choice, that he, he's a no good confirmed bachelor. He doesn't know what it means to get married. And so, uh, so it worked out OK. And uh, she did a make did, And she was in the field of government at the time. She hoped to be a translator at the United Nations, and uh, it turned out after we got married, she changed her major to education. It looked like that would be more compatible with a married life. And uh, later on, uh, changed to psychology. It was incredible. She got her PhD in psychology as well. She has more degrees than anybody I know. She has five degrees. She has her associate's degrees in general education, her bachelor's degree, which I think was in government, her master's degree, which was in education, a specialist degree in special ed, and then her doctoral degree, which was an interdisciplinary degree, including educational psychology, and ended up becoming a licensed psychologist. Uh, and uh, we continued to work together on almost everything after that. Uh, she, when she got her degree, we worked together. She started, she started her own school in Carbondale, Illinois, where we lived, uh, because there were no nursery schools. And here, our children were growing up and we needed a place to go to. And so, being the innovator that she is, she started her own nursery school, the first one in that town. And all of our children went through that school, and it closed down only when the youngest one ended up graduating from it. <laughs> Vicky already had her PhD, and so it was something of a come down to going to be the principal and the founder of the nursery school. Well, so I graduated. So I got I graduated from Harvard. I got my my degree, and then it was this is a time when they had a draft. The U.S. Army had a mandatory draft, and I had been deferred because I was going to graduate school, but now they told me my time was up, and I was drafted. And there I was, I was going to be in the Army, a private with a Ph.D. <laughs> and originally I talked to people at Walter Reed, and they, they were pretty sure they could get me there, and heck, I'd be doing research in their research facility, but that didn't work out. And, but I thought I was going to be there, and so Vicky went and looked for a job as a teacher in, in the Washington, D.C. area and obtained it. We were sure that we would, I would be stationed there, but it turned out I wasn't. I was stationed to the, in Maryland to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, to an ordnance part of the Army, and that was, uh, uh, was that, about 50, 60, 70 miles away from Washington, D.C., where she was teaching. And so I commuted. I commuted back and forth between, between the two until the, the academic year was over, and she did. Uh, and then she moved to Aberdeen, where, meanwhile, we had a, our first child, who was born on the very memorable date of December 31st, 1956, and we call her our income tax baby, and that was that she qualifies for an income tax de de dependent status deduction because it did occur within that calendar year. And so we had our first child in the Army. I think they paid something like $70 or $100 a month. And we lived in the barracks, and so it was a very meager kind of, kind of an existence. But it was very exciting, uh, and getting on to the professional part of it. Uh, in, I was in this human engineering laboratory, and that was at the time that Sputnik had just gone up in 1957. And the country became very research-minded and realized that we were no longer at the leading edge of research in this world. The Russians were. They actually put a satellite up in space. And so 
the U.S. government went and gave top priority to research in that particular department I was in. They were delighted to do research, and here they had somebody, for a Ph.D. from Harvard, and they, didn't, they didn't, weren't doing any research themselves, so they were ecstatic. I was interested in noise. That was a big interest of that particular division of the Army, especially the noise that occurred within a tank. People couldn't communicate with each other and the stress that it would produce, not to mention the noise from the new jets jet airplanes. And so I started a program of research on the effects of noise. Another area that was of great interest to them was that of fatigue, that uh, soldiers are required to do uh, any number of things that involve a good deal of physical effort. They march for hours, days at a time, and also they, the heavy weapons that they were manning, they, many of them were not completely automated, they involved a good deal of effort. And so those are two areas that I went to work on. And since my past background at Harvard was all with animals, I asked if I could start an animal lab in a human, in a human <laughs> research, this, this, this human affairs division. And they agreed. It was wonderful. And so I started an animal lab with, with rats and pigeons and monkeys. And I had, my own, I had my own animal lab there, and I was studying the effects of noise with them. And I also did some studies with humans in artificial contrived laboratory situations, studying the effects of noise. And uh, a wonderful generalization came out of that. The, we think of noise and its effects. Well, some noises, are, they're very annoying. They're fatiguing, they're distracting. They interrupt your focus and your concentration. They, go, they put a strain on your body and on your attention that they wreak havoc with your mental concentration and all. No such thing emerged <laughs> from the studies. I bought the most expensive equipment that was made in terms of generating the weirdest types of sounds, of wailing, vibrating, oscillating, going between high and low frequency, sudden onset. And in all of the studies, both with the animals and with the humans, the effects adapted out. Nothing. Nothing. And when I look back on the physiological effects that the literature showed, I went and I found that the same thing others had found who looked at the physiological effects of noise. And that is, however disruptive they were at their onset, it adapted out completely, and your PGR, your galvanic spin response, your heart rate, your blood pressure, nothing, nothing changed after the initial onset. <laughs> well, so that, that, that was mind-boggling. There was one place, however, in which noise was enormously effective. It took total control of you, and that is when it was associated with a consequence when it became a signal for something, and to give you a feel for that, if you're in a jet plane, you may be upset by the fact that there's so much noise, or if you're in a tank, you're upset that there's, upset there's so much noise, but there's nothing that will create greater havoc mentally than if that noise stops, and there's no sound of the jet when you're 30,000 miles, 30,000 feet in the air, <laughs> or if you're in the middle of a battle and your engine doesn't start, and it's silent. It's the consequence that's associated with it. And I did a number of studies that went and varied both non-contingent noise and contingent noise. And, and so that, that I'm really proud of that finding, that, and that is that it really depended on what it was associated with, it, and that indeed when the noise goes off, it can produce far more disruption than it did when the noise came on. The other area of fatigue, I'm really very proud of that discovery too, and that is uh, the st previous literature on fatigue was, of course, the fatigue, it's, it's annoying, and you get tired, and you take a break, and then you're resuscitated, you're reinvigorated, and, and there are studies, uh, there are studies in classical conditioning with Ebbinghaus of learning, and they talk about spaced versus mass learning. That is, is it better to study all at once before an exam, or should you space out the studying and do a little each night? And what happens if you have the same amount of time you spent, total amount of time you spent studying, which is better? And the results pretty clearly show that 
you were better off spacing it out. And, and that was, and you have a time out in a football game or otherwise, and it's a rest period, and the people come back reinvigorated, and so the time out produces produces an increase. Uh, and but then there was a study that was done, and as I recall, it was Bill Morse who did it in his did it in animal study and did it, did it with pigeons, and what he did is he took the time out that rest period, if you want to call it, that break, to put it in a neutral term, and made that contingent on a response. And when you did that, just as in the case of noise, everything was different. Everything was different. No longer was it just a passive background thing that evaporated and you adapted to. But it now became a reinforcer or a punisher. If you were in a if you were in an aversive situation, one that was uncomfortable, and you had a break, it was a reinforcer. And I did an experiment on that with used, used GIs. I had them engage in a standardized fatigue-producing task and, and measured the number of rotations that they did of this fatigue wheel that I had designed. And they were averaging, let's say, to use a convenient number, they were averaging something like 50 revolutions per minute. When you said go as fast as you can, and they did it for one minute, and then you gave a break. Non-contingent on behavior, but, but contingent on time. After, after one minute, you gave them a one-minute break. And then they went back to the wheel, and, and they averaged, if you averaged, and they, you did that many different cycles. And they averaged about 50 rotations per minute of this difficult wheel turning. And then now change it so that they now get the break not in terms of the clock after one minute of work, which is the way usually you have troops marching, right? You march for an hour, then you rest for 10 minutes, you march for an hour, you rest for 10 minutes, or you march for five hours, and you rest for one hour. But either way, it's by the clock. What happens if you do it differently? And that is the break is when you, get, you obtain the break depends on your behavior. So in the case of this wheel turning, suppose now that you change it so that you say you will obtain that one minute break after you have turned it 50 times. Well, of course, that's what they were averaging anyhow when they were told to turn it as fast and as much as possible. And so you think that they go the same. It didn't. Their rate of turning went up to 100. They did more. Once you base it on performance, peace work, is another word for it, then everything changes and now you have motivation. So that was the discovery you could use time out as a reinforcer. And then later when I was working, after I left the Army, when I was working with mental patients, I did a study and that was way back in the early 60s, I think 61 or 62. I went and tried it and I, I published an article that was called The Use of Time Out as a Punisher with Mental Patients. And as a, uh, what it was is I had them on a schedule of positive reinforcement. They were earning all kinds of rewards on a very positively reinforcing schedule, and then suddenly time out occurred, but contingent on one of the responses, and that response went down to zero. It was a punisher, and that was a discovery of that. And if you think of time out now, that it's used as a punisher, that now is ubiquitous. I mean, everybody. Using time out as a punisher with children and with anyone, is now part of the society's norm. That, that was my ideal. That's what I wanted. I wanted to develop things that would end up in practice and would solve human problems, practical problems. And so that common practice of time out, I, it looks like I, and I, I was the one who developed that. I didn't realize that until I saw somebody cite it in the literature and said, Azrin developed, was the first to develop time out. They were, wait a minute. I thought it was somebody else. And I looked back at the dates, and sure enough, I had preceded anybody else using it by that, and, and then had published it in journals, several different journals. And so, uh, so I was very, very proud of that. Well, I, when I left the Army, so here I was, I'm, I'm in, I'm, I'm in, this, I'm in the, this, uh, this outfit in the Army that's designated as, as working with humans and human problems, and I set up an animal lag an animal lab, and I introduced all of these plants, and I had a wonderful time there. I remember some of the anecdotal things there, that uh, the civil servants that were there came five o'clock, they, they practically broke down the door, and they all left. I was interested in doing research, and so I asked the director of the lab if I could have a key to the lab, because I wanted to stay there after hours, and I wanted to come back at night. 
uh, to go and to work on things. And uh, nobody had ever made that request before, so they had to go to practically to the secretary of the army to, for me to get permission to have my own key to, <laughs> to, to, go, and to go in and out of the lab at night. And, uh, but that's, I take that as an example of how, how exciting that was, that even though I was drafted, and it, was, it was just the kind of thing I wanted to do. And so that was very exciting. Well, then I, I, left, that, I left the army, and uh, now I was ready to obtain a permanent job. And obviously the kind of job, if you're in research, that you most likely obtain is one in academia, that you teach and you obtain research grants and you do research. Unfortunately, my, the term, my termination in the Army, the date was in January. Well, the academic year starts in September. And so academic openings when it was just not available. And so I was looking for other kinds of positions. And there were two possible positions, one of them that looked attractive. One of them was a very well-known researcher, and he had a big grant, big grant and research going, and I could work there as a research associate. And the other one was in this mental hospital. And I, I heard about that from a friend that I mentioned earlier, R. Glinsley. He was approached by somebody who was at Southern Illinois <laughs> University in Carbondale named Israel Gold Diamond. And Israel Gold Diamond, he was interested in having some uh, research at a nearby state hospital about 20 miles away called Anna State Hospital. Why Anna? Because it was in the town of Anna. And and they were looking for somebody who could do that, and so they contacted Skinner, and Skinner referred him to uh, Glinsley, and uh, Glinsley uh, spoke to um, Gold Diamond, who apparently had been doing some teaching at the state hospital and, uh, and telling them about this exciting field of operant conditioning and research. And so uh, I talked to them about it. They flew me down there, or I, flew, I paid for myself, and I went down there and I was interviewed by the superintendent who was a fantastic fellow named Steck, Dr. Steck. He was a general practitioner, but somehow became appointed as superintendent of a mental hospital. And it was, very, it was rather fortunate that he had, he, not being a psychiatry, he had no particular psychiatric theory or psychoanalytic or other theories. That, to push, uh, and uh, he was just interested in the welfare of the patients, and so that was wonderful. And so I went there, and then uh, it, uh, that a wild story ensued after that, and that is here I was, I was still in the Army, and uh, I hadn't, I didn't have that job, but had this other job where I could be an associate to someone. And uh, I kept getting word back through Gold Diamond how they wanted me there and everything was fine and, good. and I said I needed a certain amount of equipment and I, and I sent them a list of all the equipment that I needed and the expense and where they could obtain it and, and they said that they would order it so it would all be ready for me that when I came there I would hit the ground running and they would, I could stop my research immediately. And. Uh, and then we even talked roughly about salary, but that, 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 that was still somewhere of a vague, but he met, I think a ballpark figure was mentioned. And it was competitive with the academic salaries, so that wasn't important. I was interested in, do, in, in doing research, and what was exciting about that is I could start from scratch. I wouldn't be involved in a university where I had to be worried about all of the academic duties and teaching and all, that. pure research. And they gave enough money to get started, and I figured after that I could rely on my own resources to go into obtain grants, and that it'd be my own show. And I and my objective was to develop things using to take using the principles and the and the data, the hard database, to develop procedures that were of practical importance and do outcome studies with humans. And then in contrast with what I fled from when I was in that field of personality and social, there were no outcome studies. There was nothing there that in any way is a semblance of somebody doing a study would show that here is an effective treatment for any human problem. So here's a chance to do, it my, to do, to do my own thing. Well, so, so there was, I said, a humorous incident there where I we went back and forth with verbal communication and I said, I can't go unless I have something in writing. I, I can't, you know, I can't go move to another town, start a new job in <laughs> a new position. <laughs> and, and so apparently uh, Israel Goldheim convinced the superintendent that he put something in writing. So I received a one sentence, uh, one or two sentence telegram, which went and said, 
position is assured. Looking forward to your arrival. <laughs> No mention of salary, no mention of duty, no mention of budget, nothing. <laughs> well, so I went there. I did go there, and I, I remember Vicky and I, we uh, didn't have enough money to, to get there. And we needed transportation. I had a car, but I, I hadn't had a, an oil change for two years. And we went there, and uh, where would we live? We had no money. She had a contract as a teacher, but we had no money for anything, for either for rent or for anything, for furniture, nothing. So uh, when I when I uh, when I got this, so we went around begging to different loan companies. We finally found a loan company that I remember made, gave us a fifty dollar loan. And so when we got to Washington, then. I know. I got the got the money in Washington, and, and that was enough. Sears Roebuck would uh, would would actually lend the credit, and they didn't have to pay for a month or two later to go in to buy a, a table where we could eat, or uh, and a sofa, a used sofa for twenty five dollars, and a bed for thirty five dollars. <laughs> so, uh, well, that that was uh, that was on the move. That was on the move from the army. Went to, but getting back to the situation where I moved to Anna, I uh, sorry, I finally went there. And I remember driving into town, and Vicky, being the <laughs> the wonderful person she was, she never raised the question about moving to a small town, which was only 4,000 people, 500 of which were were patients at the hospital, and another 2,000 I think were employees, and the rest of them were all family members of the state of the people who worked at the hospital, and we were driving into town, and there's. Uh, and Vicky went and said, hey, we would like to stop off at the hairdresser to get herself fixed up before we meet the superintendent. And I told her, well, I hate to break the news, but I don't think there is a beauty shop in Anne, Illinois. I know there's a gas station, one, and there's one bank. <laughs> but I don't remember ever seeing, ever seeing a beauty shop there. Well, in any case, we, we did, she, I, I don't remember whether she did get to the beauty shop or not, but we did meet the superintendent, and he just was the most gracious, wonderful person in the world, Steck. He was just, he never had any anger, any impatience, anything that I wanted while I was there. He was just so cooperative, just explained to him what the situation was, and, and he was just understanding of everything. And if there were any, any people there who were, uh, cause that it, we're interfering, uh, he immediately took care of it without even saying anything to me. Just the problem disappeared. So it was just a wonderful situation. Well, there were some other interesting things in that while we were there, after I was there for about uh, two months, and I was waiting for all this equipment that I had ordered. Why wasn't it? Why wasn't it there? And I kept talking to the business manager. Why is it being held up? And then one day, there was, they said, here, we're going to have a meeting, and we're going to have the chairman of the department of nearby, that was 20 miles away, of Southern Illinois University Psychology Department will be there, and the dean there, liberal arts school, and also the, uh, the head of the research program for all of Illinois. They would be there together with the superintendent. So there were all four of these individuals, and we, so they asked. We were there and talked about it. How do you like Southern Illinois? What did you do? And uh, we were making small talk, I thought. And after it was over, the superintendent <laughs> came over to me and said, You did it, right? You're hired. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I was there for two months. I was there for two months, and he was telling me that was my interview. <laughs> and apparently, I found out later that he had uh, dipped into some other funds uh, from other resorts. And, they didn't even have a position set up for me. They had to apply for a position. They, they named it psychophysiologist. They never had that position before, at least if they did have it, they, they put me in there. But he took the funds from some other part of his operation and, the, and uh, was paying for that. Uh, well, so that, that was just a wonderful experience. And uh, we, we lived in on the grounds for the first two months. He insisted I shouldn't look for a house. And I didn't realize why he might have felt that way until I realized afterward that I wasn't hired, really. So he was putting me up in one of the hospital cottages. It was just very nice. They supplied food and everything else. Uh, well, so I, once I was there, uh, I initially I started a series of animal studies. And I continued, especially my study of aversive control, the studies of escape learning and avoidance and punishment and also a thing called conditioned suppression and had a, 
And then, just a year or two later, I decide, decided I would do something, I want to do something on the ward. And uh, that my, I was, a real shock occurred when I went on the wards to, talk, to look to see what kind of problems there were. Number one, you looked at the diagnosis, you looked at their file, and I expected from my previous studies that, you know, you had people there who were schizophrenic and manic depression and hebephrenic and catatonic and manic depressive and, and nothing like that was happening. They, did, they were doing nothing. That was the most noteworthy <laughs> aspect of it. They were doing nothing. You looked at their file to see what their diagnosis was, and it was this mysterious phrase, borderline brain disorder, brain dysfunction, and didn't present any results of a particular, particular brain injury that had been found or a brain tumor. Or, but just this is a strange statement. Um, well, they did nothing. So anyhow, I just, at, at that time, I decided, well, this sounds like a marvelous opportunity to use all these principles of learning to go and to create an atmosphere that will be beneficial to them and it will get them back to useful, independent functioning and possibly discharge. Discharge just seemed out of the question. Most of them, I think the median age was 65. Uh, most of them were older people. Many of them, you could see discs on their forehead where they'd been given a lobotomy, and uh, they were using, many of them were using insulin shock therapy, uh, uh, had been using insulin shock therapy, and, and they would be sitting in front of this television at the time, they'd be sitting in front of a television set in this place they called the day room, and the television was off. <laughs> they were staring at it. They were doing nothing. Well, so this looked like uh, just uh, it was an entirely different problem that I thought I thought I'd be working with delusions and hallucinations and with manic depression and and uh, nothing like that. It was, this is a totally different situation that was facing that. This was about the time, incidentally, that the major tranquilizers were being used. Thorazine was one of the earliest ones, but this is now in fifty six, fifty seven. Well, by a coincidence, I was an editor of a journal, and I, an article, I received an article to review, it was by a fellow named Ted Ione, A-Y-L-L-O-N, Ted Ione. And what he did is he used some rather simplistic learning procedures with mental patients during his internship. He was up in Canada. And this by simple, I mean, he had patients who were complaining or asking for something, so he said he'd try extinction, and that is not respond favorably when they asked for it, and sure enough, they did. Well, that seemed rather common sense, and so that didn't seem to be any great shakes, but, but it really broke the ice. It said, hey, you could really apply these learning principles now to these severe mental patients. But okay, but I was darned if I was going to try something that simple. So I set myself, a, 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 in retrospect, a rather grandiose objective. I was going to create an environment, a culture, that was based completely on the principles of learning. And it would be devoted to creating positive behaviors, so independent functioning. So these people would take care of each other, take care of themselves, would do something that would be self-sustaining, and use reinforcement as the motivation in a way that we had found was true in the operant conditioning studies. And so I sent a proposal in that, uh, that that's what I had in mind, and I, in those very general terms, nothing more specific <laughs> than that. But I did outline it. I did say I would use tokens as an intermediary, to, as a bridge between the response and the reinforcer, because many of these people were not only brain damaged, major brain damage, but retarded, profoundly retarded, so verbal things were out of the question. And so I did spell it out, and I sent it in, and this fellow Percival Bailey, who was a very sympathetic and hard-nosed psychiatrist that was the director of research for the state, he sent it in and he said, no, that's not research, <laughs> right? You're using mental patients on a ward and you're trying to improve it. That's service, and this grant, this research fund was designed for research. So I said, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention something, and that is this is research in the sense that these principles of learning and motivation have been found with individuals, but never to a group. That's research. You see, good. Okay, so, so he bought it. So I had it all laid out in terms of what I was going to do. And, and let me go through the steps on that because I think it was really very exciting and really a clue as to how this procedure now could be used with other populations. 
So I started on that and I worked on that. Uh, Ted Ione had a degree in clinical, which was wonderful because now I had the credibility. There was somebody who was an actual clinical psychologist, so he was the ward director. I talked to the superintendent. I said, I want a ward. And he said, okay. <laughs> and, and that was rather humorous. He said, okay, which, here, which one do you want? And here's a ward here with uh, all these people on it. And I said, well, I'd rather have a uh, ward not with all these people on it, but people that were referred. And uh, okay, so he said yeah, he'll call the medical director over, and, he called, and we'll go on the ward and talk to the ward director. And so the medical director asked to talk to the nurse, who was the the director of the ward at the time, and went and said, "Here's Dr. Asman. He's going to take over this ward, and he's going to be choosing his own patients. That is, that they'll be referred by other wards. The only people who are referred as, as unmanageable on other wards. We want the real people who are difficult." Uh, either unmanageable or untreatable, and uh, I, I want them out, uh, let's see, today is Thursday, uh, Wednesday, uh, f uh, th by this weekend. <laughs> and of course, she started stuttering and coughing, and so when, I went, impossible, um, that's ridiculous, what do you mean, there were 40 people here, uh, and you want them out by, by, by Saturday, and that's only two days, said, well, how about, how about Tuesday, how about one week? She breathed a big sigh of relief and said, sure. <laughs> well, it was at that moment that I decided any time I read a study where they talked about discharge, that a particular procedure was effective in discharging people to go in to look at it with, with, a, with a very, very close eye. That, that, that's all it took to have all of these people discharged. Well, so he gave, the, gave us this ward. All the patients that we had were by referral by other wards. They were, people, they were all the same sex, so we wouldn't have to worry about all the complications that occurred there if you had both sexes. The, um, and they were all people who were either untreatable or unmanageable, or they just wanted them out by other wards. And I wanted it to be the same size ward as all the others, so I wouldn't say that this was anything special. We, we were able to achieve any kind of unusual results because it was a small ward. And also the staff, that we'd have the same staff, the same staff to patient ratio, that that would be the same. The only thing that was different is that there would be a psychologist that would have his office on the ward. That was the only difference. Well, that was true of other wards as well. And so I tried to make it as comparable as possible. And, um, and Steck was, he was just, as I say, he was just so cooperative. He was just wonderful. And, uh, and, and so now, what do you do? Well, first of all, is what behavior? I'm going to start working on their anomalous behavior, their psychotic behavior. There wasn't any. Occasionally there would be a fight. Occasionally they would engage in what casually was called psychotic talk. But to me, the real important thing was constructive behavior, and that became a general philosophy. Concentrate not on the negative behavior, which of course is a, a reversal of what I said I was doing with punishment and working on negative behavior but rather working on positive behaviors. And if you build that up strong enough, that will displace negative behaviors. And if, anything, if they were doing anything for attention, they would be obtaining all of the attention by doing the positive behaviors. So that became a general therapeutic strategy. That is, uh -uh, don't talk about that. When people come in with telling you what's wrong, think of what is the antithesis of that? What is the opposite of that? and strengthen that, and then by its, by its very nature, by definition, if they're engaging in the opposite of it, then they're not engaging in the negative. And so what positive behaviors? Well, these are people, this is, that was a real problem. Here are individuals who are in a, in a, in a, in a very dependent relationship. They, they're dressed, they're fed if they have difficulty, they, they serve the meals, they arranged any activities, everything that they do, the, the, the place where they sleep, their beds are made for them, they, their area in the ward is kept. They, if they, they were all women, so if they need a hair, if they anything done with their hair, they were sent to the hairdresser, anything, any laundry, they were sent to the laundry, anything regarding the diet, it was sent to the diet. Everybody was there doing things for them. I said, well, I want them to be independent. And, and that created some union problems and others, but, but looking at it strictly from the psychological point of view, I want them to be independent, taking care of themselves, doing things for themselves, engaging in functional behavior. Not only some of the things that they seem to be incapable of, and that is toilet training, washing, brushing their teeth, showering, dressing, eating, eating normally, 
And so I, I wanted, in other words, those are just the, the living skills, the bare li minimum living skills, doing all those things and learning how to shower and dress and do all these things, but also the other things. And that is when the phone rang, that they would answer it that they would do the cleaning up when they needed someone to do, uh, they said, cleaning the grounds, picking up things out, outside, doing, the, doing their laundry and their washing, uh, in terms of serving food, that they would serve each other and not stand there and somebody spoon feeding them. So, uh, how do you do that? Well, a, 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 a wonderful insight that occurred was, when I asked the question, what is it that needs doing, was look at what the job description of the employees. The state is paying the employees to do these things, so it's obviously something that has to be done, and so have them do it. Well, of course, that runs into union problems, and that is that if you have them do it, then the, union, the employees are going to be justifiably very upset about it, and that is that here are these people who are in a state of almost indentured servitude, they have to be there, and they're doing their work, and they're not getting paid. And so the solution to that was the simple one of have them assigned as an assistant to an employee. And what do you do if you're an employee and somebody gives you an assistant? Who is it that ends up doing the work? Whether you're a bureaucrat or a president or whatever, you're assistant. And so they, they ended up working shoulder to shoulder with them. So if you visited the ward, and you're going to be shown around the ward. It wasn't an employee who showed you around. It was a patient. And the, the psychologist there needed a secretary. I needed a secretary. Who was it that was going to be the secretary? I, did I ask for civil service thing? I went and asked for an, an employee. So, uh, I asked for an employee. So, <clears throat> so that, that was the general rule then that cut across different populations. And when we came to work with family problems, that's what you looked at. What work is it that has to be done? What is the parent doing that has to be done? And when you're asking what kind of positive behaviors is it that you have, that you want of the children or the teenager or of the spouse or whatever, that's what you look at. Well, so that took care of the positive behavior part into identifying that. But why should they do it? You tell them to do, tell the patient to do any of those things and they just turn, turn away from you. They, they don't hear you. And that, in other words, what are you to say in technical terms? What is the reinforcement? And so the general objective was to now do the same thing. You remember we talked about in the fatigue study? You <laughs> make things contingent, that is, depend on their behavior. And that is, they find a list of reinforcers that, you, that you're going to use and make them available to the people for their, with their behavior. And how many reinforcers? Just an M&M &M or a cigarette? Uh-uh. Everything in their life that they wanted, every long-term result, including discharge from the hospital, going in downtown, going visiting with their parents, having parents visiting with them, having their choice of living quarters, having, their, having special services with the chaplain, everything, everything in life, long-term, long-term values, long-term goals, try to arrange everything. And so that's what I did. I went and I arranged everything. And as who, when they, they fought over who went in to eat first, uh, well, the order in which they went in to eat was something that they would earn. The people who, <laughs> who, went and performed, who were performing the most functional behaviors. Where they slept, their rent, to use the exa example in, outside the institution. That would depend on the, <coughs> on the functional behaviors. So, I'm, I gave them everything. So given that this thing could work, what did you end up with? People that were independent, doing everything for themselves, not depending on the state for employees to do everything for them. They were ready to be discharged. If they, anybody could take them, they'd go into their home and they could do everything. And were they being coerced to do it? No. Everything in their life that they wanted. Right, everything to read or to watch television or who watched it or everything. They go away home, go on visits, everything that they wanted, uh, tangible, intangible, and put them together. And the way of putting them together was points. Well, of course, these people they couldn't, most of them couldn't read, many of them couldn't read, they certainly couldn't do arithmetic. And so I had to use something tangible, and that was the token. 
And that, that was the reason we used it, because many of them were profoundly retarded. So here's something tangible, and they could tell the difference between a stack of 10 tokens and one token. And so it became labeled token economy, not by me, by somebody else who visited the ward. They called it a token economy, and that, that caught on. Well, so that, I, ran that to I ran that procedure, it ran for six, six years before I published anything on it. I wasn't rushing in print, I wanted the system to be durable, to see that it worked, that it was compatible with their life, and with different patients that were coming in and out all of the time. So it was different kinds of patients that were in there and different circumstances in the hospital. And that's, the, it became, I called it the token economy. Actually, the title I used in the article I wrote didn't use the word token economy. It went in, it, it went in, it's called a motivational, a motivational system for therapy and rehabilitation of mental hospital patients. And that's what it was. It was a mental of therapy and rehabilitation. Well, that, that procedure was replicated uh, hundreds of times in articles with mental patients and with retarded. And now I look around and I see it's, it's standard procedure. And that's what I wanted. Before, when I was doing basic research, and which I was doing almost concomitantly, I measured my success in terms of the extent to which my studies were cited by other studies and building on it. And that's pretty much the tradition in science. But to what extent is your, your study uh, the basis for other people's research? That wasn't my goal anymore. My, my goal now was, have I developed something that's going to help people? And, and dissemination, is it, does it work? And it turns out now if you have conduct disorder for, for children or youth, token economy. ADHD, token economy, all right? Uh, ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, token economy. Special ed classes almost throughout, throughout the world, that pr almost all of them use token economy. In the local mental hospitals when they're dealing with youth or young adults, token economy. You know. you know, it, they have different systems. They call it the point system or the reward system or wh whatever system you call it. It's that procedure. And, 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 and I have a saying in my own mind that I think of that if nothing else works, token economy. Because what you're doing in the token economy, you're taking every motivation in the world that that person has and you're bringing it to bear on them. And what are you bringing it to bear? On their positive behaviors things that are incompatible with the symptomatic behaviors or the referral behaviors and just make it incompatible with it. So, well, so that, that's one of the big innovations. And let me go down the list now somewhat briefly and maybe tell you a little bit of the story behind developing each one of them. I told you about timeout. I told you about the one about the effects of noise. I told you about the token economy. Well, an another major thing that I'm known for professionally is uh, the field of retardation. In the field of retardation, that was under pre previously pretty much under the jurisdiction of the field of education, and they classified retarded individuals as either educable retarded, that means in a classroom, non-educable means it had to be individual, trainable, it means on a one-on-one -on -one you could teach them things, and then the bottom of the rung, untrainable. <laughs> right? On an IQ level that corresponds to roughly an, an IQ of less than 20 or less than 35 or less than 40 or less than uh, 60. So I set my goal as train, I want to develop procedures for training the untrainable. <laughs> These individuals were not toilet trained, they were, it wasn't that they were young, they were 50s or 40 years old and everybody had tried to train them. They couldn't dress themselves, they had to be dressed, they didn't eat normally, they, many, they wouldn't be given a knife and a fork because it was too dangerous and they didn't know how to use it. They literally lowered their head into the food, they call it pigging and how to get them to eat with cutlery and eat in a normal way with a knife and a fork and a spoon. And I set out to do that, and, and, without go and, and, and I succeeded. I succeeded, and I published the articles, and now they're standard procedure in all institutions for the retarded, and mild versions of modifications of them are used for the higher levels of retarded. But then what happened is the business manager of the institution said uh, his, they were having trouble with toilet training their child, normal child, not, not an institution. And uh, I had succeeded so well with, the, with these profoundly retarded that it must be a piece of cake. How about trying something with the normals? So I went back to the drawing board, and of course it was altogether different because you were talking about children of toilet training age. It's two or three years of age. They're verbal. They're enthusiastic. <laughs> they're 
you can use symbols, you can use rehearsal, you can use verbal instructions. And so I developed a, 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 a totally different procedure for them and tried it out empirically, went and tried it out with advertised for parents who had children of toilet training age and took the children and tried the procedures out with them and developed this procedure and until it worked and worked fast. <laughs> And the, the average time to train them was three and a half hours. That's all. And, and I wrote a book on it. Or I published a journal article and found out, well, nobody reads. Who's going to read it? Who's going to read a journal article and learn how to toilet train their child? So I said, well, the way to do it is to give a pocketbook, have a, a paperback. And so I went and I, I wrote a book, and the title of it is Toilet Training in Less Than a Day. Not in a day, in less than a day. It's only three and a half hours. <laughs> And I went and published the thing, and, and, and it was a bestseller, and, and it's, it's been translated into every language there is, and it's still in print, and, uh, and it's, all, it's all over. I just received a request uh, recently for another country. They, they're translating into their country. Well, so that's what the public knows my work mostly by. They use Time Out, but they don't know who developed it. They use Token Economy, a point system, but they don't know who developed it. <laughs> but it had a total of training in less than a day is what they... they they know, they know that I develop. Well, so uh, training the untrainable. Well, in addition to that, after the other big thing that I developed that in terms of dissemination and actual usage was employment. What's more important in this world than employment? Getting a job. I mean, we all wish that there was full employment in this country now. There'd be no problems with banks or with anything else. If you have a job, everything is bright. And in terms of the token economy, it was after having ta taught these people to get to go to be independent, the next step is, well, what about discharge? And so I, I l looked at the literature and uh, to look at what, what methods have been found to be effective in, help, in finding people, helping people to find jobs. And they, uh, there's nothing. There was nothing. <laughs> it's, a, it's incredible. The government has all kinds of employment programs and all, but you ask to what extent were there any outcome studies done? And that was the big thing. That's what I considered to be the exciting thing. I've worked in a dozen different problem areas, and the exciting thing is to bring to that area the idea of having standardized, specified procedures and doing outcome studies to ascertain and to, and to, to develop methods that are effective. And so uh, I went and did that with, I went and did that. So in the case of job finding, there was nothing there. So what things have been used with mental patients? None. Nothing's been used. So I went ahead and tried some things on my own, and uh, it didn't work at all. I tried the obvious things, and they had to send them to learn a skill so they'd be experienced and they'd get a job. There was nonsense. None of them got a job, even though they were experienced. It turns out the personal factors are the important ones. Anyhow, I did a survey and uh, to find out what were these personal factors, and I found out that one of the statistics, I did my own questionnaire survey, that two-thirds of individuals uh, uh, obtained their recent job, they had learned about their recent job, through a friend, a relative, or acquaintance, 67%. Two-thirds of them. Not want ads, not sending out resumes, <laughs> not the newspaper, but two-thirds of them, they found it from a statement by a relative, a friend, or an acquaintance that they even heard about it, never mind what they said in the interview. And so, so I, I went ahead and developed, I tried, had some false starts. The first one was to give them experience, and I thought if it was experience, of course, people will grab them. And, and that's not true, that the personal factors are important. And so I developed the procedure, and I initially tried it out with individuals, and then when it got boring, that we've got a job for every one of them, said, well, now let's see how is this economical, because it's too expensive to have a licensed psychologist or a professional person one-on-one, -on -one -on -one, that even if it only takes a week, that's a, that's a big chunk of money, so how about doing it as a group, right? The old, you know, what Ford did with automobiles, you know, do, this, do, <laughs> do mass production, and so did it with a group with something like 10 or 12 people in a group, and I did it first with people who were normal job seekers, because I looked at the literature and there was nothing done with, with, there was nothing done with normals either. There were all kinds of procedures that have been used, but they hadn't been subject to outcome studies. And so I did outcome study and did present, presented a procedure, tried it with normal job seekers, and, uh, and it was fantastic. I, it, not over 90% of them found a job in the control group, the people who looked on their own. 
their job success was something like 30 percent, 40, 50 percent. And so, well, I so I come full circle, right? <laughs> and I'll come back to meditation. So I said, here, I'm going to go and try it now with people who have job difficulties. And so first of all, people who have gone for more than a year looking for a job and can't find it, but also ex-mental hospital patients, ex-retarded patients, ex people who are in AA, people who are prisoners. And at that time, Vietnam vets couldn't find jobs either, so I got them. And then people who are physically disabled. I went to this Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, so people who are crippled or blind. Anyway, and I tried them, and again, I randomly assigned them to either the job club procedure or to an alternative procedure, which is commercially available, which I call the rah-rah procedure. You bring them together and tell them you're good, the world wants you, you just have to persevere and get them all excited about it. And uh, I used their procedure, it was on tapes, so I didn't have to duplicate it with my own assistant. And ran it, and, uh, and again, the ones that were in the job club, they were over 90% found a job within the six-month period, and the people who were in the control group, remember this is a handicap group, their rate of finding a job was down around 20%. It was almost no, nothing at all. And they did the usual statistics, did they keep the job, and what did they get paid, and how did that compare, and it, it, it came out golden. Well, so I, the federal government contacted me, they said they heard about it, and asked if I would go and would do a thing with their welfare program, that they had a welfare program, and the welfare program required people who couldn't find a job on their own to receive welfare. And if we could go and find jobs for them, they, all that money would be saved. And so they asked if I would go and do a thing with their people, and, and, and they insisted that it had to be with their counselors. I couldn't use my counselors, so that <laughs> you know, there wouldn't be any kind of halo effect there. And so, and it would, and they would select the cities, and they selected five cities in which there was an extremely high uh, unemployment rate. I remember Harlem was one of them, and Seattle was one at the time because the Boeing plant was out of business, and uh, I think Newark was one that at that time was becoming a ghost town. And so they, they selected several different cities, all of which had unemployment rates that were above 12, 14 percent or whatever, and I sent my counselors down to work with them in their state employment service, and they were randomly assigned either to work with one of the counselors in the state employment service, and, or, so it wasn't, uh, there wouldn't be no placebo effect here. They were, the, these people were actively count, counseled. And, they, and we tried it out in all those places, and uh, same result. And that is that the people who were assigned, <laughs> who were in the job club, they obtained jobs. And the only reason that they never, that they didn't obtain it was if they dropped out early, but, but if they stayed in the job, because you couldn't absolutely coerce them, it depended on them staying with it in order to get welfare. Well, and so that worked out beautifully, and what happened is, and that became adopted. And, and, people, and other countries have adopted it. When I was in England, I saw signs up there saying, need a job, get a job club. We were in Australia, there was a sign again, join the job club. And I wrote a book on it, and uh, let's see, so I, I, I brought this, this title of this book, I don't know if you can read it, called Job Club Counselor's Manual, and, and that's a guide to counselors. And I deliberately made it so that it's the size of an 8 by 11 page, and no hardcover. And I did that with my wife, Vicki. She, she ran the job club in many of the places. I say, by this time, we were working together. And so it was the best of all possible worlds. And, and, and they could, you could photocopy it easily, right? Because there's no hard cover. You could put it on a photocopy, Xerox machine, <laughs> photocopy. In other words, I wasn't trying to make money on it. I wanted this used. I want, what's more important than people are getting a job? And it's the people who can't afford it. And so, and many of the job club counselors in other cities, because many cities adopted it, because they, it, like them, like uh, the government, they were, had welfare programs, and if they could get people to have a job, they didn't have the welfare program. And so many of those job club counselors, they drew up contracts with different cities, and that's still true now, and they make a deal with them, that uh, they will charge so much per placement, not for just running them and making the services, but per placement, that you only get paid, the council only gets paid if they place them. Of course, that's the old business of contingency, right? That you make the reward <laughs> dependent on your performance. And uh, in other countries, they invited to Stockholm and to the Scandinavian countries, and they are required procedure. In England, it's a required procedure if you want to be on welfare. In Australia, it is. 
Canada also has it. Other countries have it. <laughs> I just got a request from Japan, and they said they wanted the translation rights to to the book because they they want to use it there. Well, and then for those people who didn't have a job club available, I wrote another book. And uh, where is it? Is, in here? is the other book here? The one? Uh, yeah. That for people who didn't have a job club around, that's run by a trained job club counselor, that an individual book. It's, whoops, where are we here? Finding a job, and that's paperback. And again, <laughs> it's for the individual job seeker. And again, it teaches them how to go into find. How, remember, the most important step is finding the place that will interview you. <laughs> I'm not training you for the interview so much, or. Looking through the want ads, where every want ad that appears, there are 500 people that apply for it, and you're in conduct, but looking for creating jobs. So uh, they did that, and backtracking, as long as we're talking about books, uh, that, uh, this book that I wrote on the token economy, there it is, if you can read it, it says the token economy, and again, uh, I, I decided that the journals were not the best way of dissemination, that people read. And, uh, and writing books that are geared to the people who are going to implement it. And, uh, the, uh, and then the other area, that, the other book that I mentioned, that the other topic I mentioned that's, uh, that's also in the book, right? Toilet training in less than a day. <laughs> and, and again, it's still, it's still in print. And the thing that, oh, and that's, uh, yeah, they've got it here. It's, yeah, toilet training, and this toilet training the retarded, and this is Japanese version. And, uh, and apparently in China, they, they were told me that the Chinese use it, but the, they refuse to pay royalties. They, they, they're not part of the international code. As you know, they don't even pay royalties, and they steal videotapes and all. Uh, but I did, uh, I did publish a book specifically for the retarded, so that staff members could do it. And many parents have written to me and said that they've used that book because they have a retarded child or a retarded adult. And so the end result is I want to change the world. I want to develop cures for all kinds of problems. And unlike most psychology pro departments where they, they, they look at this thing called the DSM-3, what are the classic neuroses? Well, there's depression and anxiety. You know? Well, they don't work with toilet training. <laughs> they don't, the retarded, they're untrainable. And employment? What's a psychologist doing working with them? Well, those are the important things. <laughs> so there are several other areas that I, I worked on that I, I think I, 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 I went and I accomplished something that has really helped hundreds of thousands of millions of people. And, uh, and, and, those are, and they include many of those things that are outpatient basis, but I always looked at what is it that causes problems for people and how can I develop something that will eliminate it. Some of the other areas, and maybe uh, I'll just list them, and uh, I actually have a list here that was made up for me because there were so many different areas I've worked on, which is why I think I have the most exciting profession in the world. Don't have to worry about making money. <laughs> Don't have to worry about beating anybody. <laughs> it's how to develop something that will help people. So here, let me list some of them. Uh, one of them here is that's listed as alcohol. I developed a procedure called community reinforcement method that is now one of the major methods that's been validated to help with alcoholism. Another is drugs, and I developed a procedure that that's goes by the name of family behavior therapy, and especially with use with youth, and, and, but also with adults, but for eliminating drugs, not only hard drugs, but also some of the soft drugs like, like marijuana, as long as it's illegal. And it's, uh, here I have another one here. Oh, Tourette. Yeah, Tourette is something that's considered to be neurological, that you can't do anything with it. And people who have a Tourette, they usually go to a neurologist or a psychiatrist. Well, you can train, you can treat it with that. And there's nothing I like more than having somebody come in with Tourette, because in one hour, in one hour after they come in, they're able to control it. It's fantastic. I know when the parents look at it, they, they can't believe it. They say, "You did you hypnotize him? Is he on drugs?" Or was he? But so that's so that's on Tourette disorder, and and that is that it, it's something that's eminently treatable by psychological procedures, and, and, and not to just learn to teach the person to live with it, which is what they figure psychologists do. Uh uh People come in and say, "I'll I'll, I'll, I'll enable you to get rid of it." So that's another one, and, uh, uh, but uh, I said I was going to list them all briefly, and let's see, this one, oh, nervous habits of other sort. 
that people have all kinds of tics, and that comes under the heading of a psychological disturbance, and there you have tics, and they're considered also to be they're considered also to be neurological in their origin. But on nervous habits, there are all of these other types of nervous habits, such as the tics. And again, they're considered to be neurological. Well, you can control them. Sometimes there's an actual physical insult that occurred to the person, and that there's obviously some nervous damage that's done, but still, the psychological procedures are a way of bringing them down to either a tolerable or to a zero, to a zero level. Uh, Trichotillomania, that's a formidable looking, <laughs> formidable sounding word, especially the mania. Uh, the common word for that is hair pulling. I didn't know that at the time, and I knew that people had that problem. But uh, uh, again, uh, developed a procedure for that. And again, with these very rapid, that within a day or two can teach you how to control it and how to get rid of it. And it's based on data, not, not my impression. And then, uh, another type that uh, comes under the heading of somewhat hip, some people call a uh, nervous habit, nail biting. That's probably the most common problem that m a majority of individuals, the studies show, either have been, are, or will be a persistent <laughs> nail biter. <laughs> and I developed a procedure for that. And again, outcome study. I did a study on that. It's a whole different procedure. It's different than the other. All of these are different from each other. So I'm not taking one method and applying it blindly. All of these. They, they, each one of them looks entirely different than the other. And, and this is something that's get rid of it. The other one, stuttering. Now, there, there's something of a problem because the, the, many of the states have this strange regulation that says that people can't, the only people that can treat, legally treat stuttering are people who have a degree in speech pathology. Well, it turns out psychologists like myself have done research on that. And again, that's almost like the Tourette. People come in with stuttering. I can go and teach them a procedure so that in one day, in one day, a two-hour session, they will know how to speak normally. That doesn't mean they will, because they have to break, they have to remember to in impose that procedure, but if they just stop themselves and impose that, they'll get it out, whether it's their name that they're having trouble with, or whatever the words are. Uh, and then the next one is uh, almost like the job thing that, in, you know, next to well, the nail biting, that's the most common problem. Job finding, that's the most important one, obviously. The retarded, that's the most impossible one. But another one, that's the one that involves the most happiness, is marital counseling, right? And so I, I worked on that. And this fellow, Dick Stewart, he broke the ground on that. I'm not the first on that, unlike the other problems. But he, he did one of the first studies on that. And, uh, and I continued on it, and I think it makes it much more acceptable. And, and again, that's so satisfying. People come in at each other's throats, and, and, they, and they walk out, and they're, they're happy, right? So there's probably no single institution that's more important to individuals' happiness than the marital, either functional or legal. And that is, what is it, over 90% or so of individuals I are married, either functionally or, or legally, even those who obtain a divorce, the majority of them do remarry that people are often impressed by the fact that a majority of in marriages result in a divorce. Uh, that's looking at the negative side of it. The point is that if you look at what is the probability of a marriage continuing during the next year without a divorce, the rate of divorce per year is usually less than 2% per year. You say, well, now how do you get this 50% people talk about? Well, if people are married for 50 years after they get married, then at 1% a year, then that will count for that. But uh, it, it, lasts, it, it lasts for far longer than jobs do, or your car, or the, your children being with you. Uh, it's the, one of the most durable institutions there is. Well, that's on the marital. Let's see, I'm not going to get to the others here. Let's see, the other one is uh, that I have here is... Child rearing, right. And I already mentioned the toilet training, but the general procedures is a positive parenting that is relying on positive procedures and using things such as overcorrection and positive, positive practice. Uh, that those things and the token economy, they, that they lend a whole different picture to child rearing. And uh, the next one, that of school problems, because I also applied these things to school situations, to classroom situations, the problem classrooms. And I know one of my own children uh, came home one day and told me that we started a new procedure in school today 
called the Tolkien Economy and started describing it to me. And the teacher who had instituted that in the school, not because their children were causing a problem, because he felt that would be a way of increasing their motivation. Uh, the uh, depression, the, comp the, the most common procedure now that's used for depression is this thing uh, that's uh, primarily attributed to Beck called cognitive therapy. Well, there have been a number of studies, and mine is one of the, one of the leaders in that, that uses behavioral procedures and uh, doesn't use cognitive therapy in its own right. It, it's based on the premise that when you start doing things that make you happy, then your thoughts will follow, rather than the alternative, which is think positive and the actions will follow. Well, I'm not sure of that. <laughs> You can go and think positive about being unemployed, but the best way to solve the problem is to go and to get, obtain a job. Uh, the anxiety is the, is the other one, and uh, there, uh, there are some procedures that I have incorporated in dealing with other problems that involve anxiety reduction, and they involve dealing with the physical aspects of things, such as Joe Walpi, who's a pioneer in the area that is using re relaxation, changes in breathing, talking about specific behaviors being changed rather than you just re restructuring and thinking, having a, looking at the world through pink colored glasses and there's make the world different and then there's a reason for the anxiety to go down. And uh, the same thing is true with regard to phobias and that is that rather than uh, just simple exposure to it, having the, te having the people engage in the positive behaviors that are the antithesis the to of the phobia, to actually engage in it, to it, seek it out. Uh, and then the last one that I have here, I'm not sure what it says. Uh, I don't know what, what it says here. What, oh, oh, I didn't mention in your recess, right. <laughs> and I'm really proud of that one. And, that is, and that's this other book I have. It's called The Parent's Guide to Bedwetting Control. Because I remember Og Lindsley, who I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about what kind of thing we, impact we wanted to have in psychology, uh, he went and he mentioned, well, if there was one thing that he, that he would not work on, because it was the only thing that there was an outcome study on, and that was the Maurer procedure for bedwetting. And, uh, and I found myself, uh, oddly enough, working on bedwetting and, and developing an entirely different procedure to be, for that that could be used in conjunction with the Maurer. Well, so I ended, so we got to the bedwetting, so I ended up working on that anyhow, and the reason for that is I tried the Maurer procedure out with the retarded, and it didn't work at all, because it depended on them being awakened by the alarm and getting up, they just slept through it. So I developed this other procedure, and after developing it with the retarded, I just modified it as I did the other and tried it with normal children, and it worked very well with normals. And uh, So, well, so th those are a list of the various Procedure. Oh, and then in terms of what am I doing now? Well, I'm still teaching at Nova Southeastern University. That's in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, there are two other areas that I didn't mention. One of them is ADHD, Attention Deficit Disorder. And I discovered an entirely different way of dealing with that, something very, very new. And then another procedure was with bulimia. How do we eliminate bulimia? And then still another procedure was that of just straight weight control, something that didn't involve dialing, that you eat the same amount of foods, but you do something else in addition. And so all of this is really a panorama, right? You work on all these areas, right? From dieting to bulimia to mental, to mental retardation to psychosis to job finding to marital. And, and so this has just been the, the greatest ride in the world, you know, and they'll say to anybody, be a psychologist, <laughs> everything. And when I approach all of these, it isn't to make money, it's got nothing to do with it. It's the satisfaction of seeing people, all these people benefiting from it. It's not just one person or, or it's publishing something in a journal article, but publishing it in a, bo in, in a book or elsewhere and people adopting it. And so. I'm still at Nova, so I'm at Nova, and I've been there since 1980, and I've continued working on many of these problems that I mentioned to you during that time. In terms of what kind of things to get back to the personal that I do for, the, aside from the professional, to go and to leave that, that part of it, uh, one of my favorite activities really is my gardening. <laughs> Somebody just handed me this last bunch of bananas that I've grown in my backyard. And that is, I have three different uh, banana banana growths there, and then also uh, I have an incredible mango tree, 
and uh, it, it was it was actually showering me with mangoes. I was counting the number that came down. It was uh, I'd, I'd wait six hours, and there would be six mangoes. They were kind of down at the rate of one one per hour. Well, there there I've got it. These are two samples <laughs> that we have, and uh, we putting them in the refrigerator, putting them on ice. My favorite activity now is one uh, that I'm doing with my wife, uh, dancing, dancing. And, uh, and we dance, we call it ball, we go to a place that's called ballroom dancing, but what we do doesn't look anything like ballroom dancing. Here's a picture someone took, took of me and her. <laughs> that's Vicky. And I have her bent over here. And then here's another one. In, the, in other words, we're, we're all over the place. We, we just, we, we're not doing a, one, two, three, four, one step, you know, step together, step kind of thing. That one of the general rules is don't repeat the same step within any five minute period that you always. And we have, a, so we have a great time on that. And, and it's really a high point. That no matter where we go on it, people are, nobody ever says you dance well. That nobody ever says that, but what they awesome. do say is, we have more fun watching you than you're awesome. You, awesome, yeah, that's a Vicky was reminding me. You're awesome. They enjoy watching watching us, and 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 we hear that we never go to a dance in any place without somebody, at least one person, sometimes as many as ten, either applauding us or, or saying that they're entertained. They're entertained by us. But in terms of my doing the tango better than anyone else, uh-uh. Or the waltz, uh-uh. Nothing is more boring to me than the waltz or the tango. And, and uh, they sing those kisses. Oh, yeah. While we're dancing, people will be applauding and they'll send kisses to us and say, yay. <laughs> and so it's really a psychological high. We have more fun. We have more fun doing that. And it's, yay! <laughs> and I even bring some of my children with us to some of our dances, and they go and they watch us. And whenever we go into a street festival, if there's a band there or anybody that's playing an instrument, we just dance to it. Or if we're walking down the street and there's a restaurant with the music playing, we walk in and we start dancing. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's been fun. Right. Thank you very much for your patience and your attention. Bye. Unforgettable That's what you are Unforgettable Though near or far Like a song of love that clings to me How the thought of you does things to me Never before Has someone been more Unforgettable In every way And forevermore And forevermore That's how you'll stay That's how you'll stay That's why, darling It's incredible That someone so unforgettable Thinks that I am Unforgettable too
That's why, darling, it's incredible that someone so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too.